Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today for this session, where we'll be uh, speaking about the Local Pathways Fellowship, what we do, and some of our success stories uh, from the fellowship. Um, well, welcome everyone to the fourth day of the Zero Emission Solutions Conference. Um, and I will um, start uh, with the presentation just to be respectful of everyone's time as we are right at the hour. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen and I would like to start with a quick video just to get everyone in the mood of what we will be speaking about on this session. SDSN Youth is one of the world's biggest networks that is mobilizing young people for sustainable development. We do that by connecting young people to pathways for action and mobilization. We understand that the sustainable development goes might seem extremely audacious, but we believe that solutions to SDGs are within our grasp. They do not require moonshoot solutions. All they need is your ingenuity, determination, as well as willingness to take action. People around the world are working extremely hard to mobilize themselves, to mobilize their constituencies, and to mobilize their communities. And SDSN, through its a wide array of programs, is doing this by connecting them to pathways for local action. At the Local Pathways Fellowship, we focus our efforts on building capacity among the youth, capitalize on their energy, their creativity, but ultimately on their potential to advance problem solving in cities. And we do so by offering an interdisciplinary program that equips young urban leaders with the tools and resources they need to localize the SDG lab and implement solutions that address the challenges of our ever changing urban environments. With four cohorts under our belt, we have successfully grown into a network of 350 fellows from 180 different cities around the world who are leading change on the ground and improving the quality of life in the cities they represent. Our program invites urban optimists who are ready to make bold impact. Uh, well, that is our um, quick teaser that we have promoting the fellowship as our call for applications are currently open. Uh, and now I'm going to go a little bit more in depth of what we do at the Local Pathways Fellowship. As uh, Brian mentions at the beginning of the video, uh, the Local Pathways Fellowship is one of the programs from SDS and Youth. SDS and Youth has multiple programs that empower the youth to um, advance problem solving towards sustainable development. And the Local Pathways Fellowship is the one that focuses in cities uh, and specifically on SDG 11. So, uh, well, the goal uh, is to implement uh, young urban leaders with the tools and knowledge they need to, to implement uh, solutions in their cities. And then I would like to uh, maybe just start a little bit on why we focus on youth and in cities. Uh, well, in cities, because uh, as you know, uh, a large majority of uh, the world population already lives in cities, and that is only forecasted to ramp up up to 2030 and up to 2050 to 50% uh, and 70% of the world population living in cities. 
And then why do, does our program focus on youth? Is because today more than 3.5 billion people uh, are under the age of 30. This is half of the world's population is under the age of 30. And uh, they are the ones that are more likely going to be moving to cities. So uh, cities are very young today and they, they're only gonna be receiving young uh, uh, people uh, in, in the, like, moving, in, moving into cities. Um, uh, that's why we believe the achievement of, of the sustainable development goals will either be achieved or will fail in cities because of the amount of uh, people they uh, contain, the amount of fishes they, they hold and the, the potential that they have. Uh, so here at the Local Pathways Fellowship, we support capacity building in cities by training young urban sustainability leaders. Uh, we create a support system where we recognize them as a partner in building better cities and communities. Uh, we have seen how uh, many times decision-making does not incorporate the youth, despite the fact that they are the ones that are gonna be living the consequences of the decisions made today the longest. Yeah. So for this, uh, we have uh, the Local Pathways Fellowship Program, which is a 10 month uh, program. This is a 10 month course. The fellows uh, apply. Uh, we usually open our applications through October and November, and uh, we receive around 1,000 applications from which we choose the 100 top applicants to be part of the cohort for that year. Uh, they begin the program in uh, February and the program finishes in November. So we are uh, graduating our current cohort this month. And throughout the 10 months, they need to complete multiple uh, pillars of the fellowship. Uh, one of them is completing the Sustainable Cities course, which is part of the SDG Academy. This is a course led by Armer Rebbe, who is the director of the uh, Indian Impact uh, Human Settlements. Uh, in, um, well, in India, he's uh, one of the uh, urban leaders uh, in, the, in the region. So uh, this is one of the portions that they need to complete for the fellowship. Uh, another one is parallelly through completing this course, they also go on developing a project of their own for which they receive monthly assignments that guide them through the development of their project. Uh, another one is a, we have a webinar series for them where every month we invite an expert from the industry to share their insights uh, and, and uh, connect with the fellows. Um, so that they can uh, see what's going on in the industry and get any uh, tips. Uh, then uh, what I believe is the strongest asset of the network is the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, contributions. Uh, we have more than 350 fellows that have gone through this program and this spans across 180 cities around the world. Uh, so the ability of them to connect with other fellows in other cities where they see a solution that has been implemented and be able to get uh, some lessons learned uh, so that if they're thinking of, of implementing the same solution in their project, they can uh, skip through some errors is uh, definitely very valuable. Or if you see two uh, cities that are facing the same issue, you can compare what solution would be better for one or the other. Uh, then just this past year, we launched the mentorship program where we invite former fellows to mentor our current fellows. So we recruited 50 um, alumni to mentor two fellows from the current cohort. So uh, these, uh, these fellows were paired either by the region that they are based in or by the topic of focus that they, uh, their expertise lies on. Um, so this was also very uh, helpful and it keeps the, the network alive and the alumni engaged. Uh, we also help with visibility opportunities, which includes uh, getting speaking events and shining the light on the projects that they uh, have developed throughout the year, uh, such as this, uh, this session that we have here today. Uh, but we also spread the word of their projects through our social media channels, our website, uh, blogs. We get them interviews at magazines or featured in books um, and so on. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the project development process, as you will be seeing after my presentation, some of the projects they have developed. 
so the first half of the program, the first five months, are focused on a lot of research and exploration, uh, basically digging deep into what issues their city is facing, uh, what stakeholders are involved, uh, if there are any policies around their issue, if there's any data available. And then on the second half, uh, they move on to the idea generation. Uh, they start uh, developing an idea and shopping it around with the stakeholders that they have uh, found are active in the, in the issue of their, of their uh, project. Uh, they uh, get feedback from other fellows as well. They get feedback from stakeholders. And uh, ultimately, uh, they, they solve a problem. Uh, at the end, a lot of fellows either pilot or roll out their project throughout these 10 months. And then, as we know, it's very ambitious to uh, land a project at the city level in 10 months. Uh, a lot of them stay in the concept development, but keep on working on their projects afterwards and uh, run it uh, on the ground uh, a few months later. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we have a co four cohorts uh, that have gone through the program so far that uh, encompass 355 fellows from 180 different cities. Uh, we have covered uh, all regions through the program. And uh, these are some of the phases of some uh, former fellow. And uh, just to speak a little bit about the distribution of where the um, uh, fellows uh, come from, uh, we uh, analyzed uh, where applicants and the, the regions where the fellows come from just this year. And we realized that 85% of the applicants come from the global south. And then 65% make it uh, into the program from the global south. Uh, this speaks directly to the fact that today's large cities are concentrated in this region and that 60% of urban growth will uh, take place in, in this region by 2050. Uh, so this is uh, just something to keep in mind. The solutions we design uh, need to have a special focus on these regions as uh, this is where most of the impact and change can uh, happen. Uh, this, uh, we have a team of uh, nine and uh, we are based all over the world and based in Mexico City. We have people in uh, France, uh, Cyprus, the United Arab Emirates, uh, Canada, and uh, the US. And uh, as I mentioned right now, we have our call for applications open. Uh, you can check the link for applying on our Twitter channel, which is at Local Pathways. And um, unfortunately, our website is having a little glitch at the moment, but it will be fixed later today. And now, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to be seeing some uh, of the projects that were developed throughout the, the fellowship. Uh, to start, uh, we have a Regina Paredes. Uh, she is based in Mexico, and uh, she will uh, be uh, kicking it off uh, today. Uh, so now, uh, Regina. Uh, yes. I, I, Thanks, Anna. Can you see my screen? Only can you tell me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, as Anna said, I'm Regina. I'm the founder of Muevetex and I'm a local pathways fellow from this cohort. And the the project that I'm implementing, it's called Actualization of the Database of Public Transport System in Toluca, Mexico, by the digital, digitalization of the public transport routes. And it is focused in the target 11.2 to have safe, affordable, accessible, and sustainable transport systems for all. So the global issue is that globally, 6.2 billion people rely on public transport according to Where Is My Transport. And only half of the population has convenient access to public transport. This means that they can access to public transport in a distance of 500 meters if it's like urban buses and a kilometer if it's like suburban routes or metropolitan routes. And here in, in Toluca, where, where I live, 
Seven of every 10 people spends almost two hours a day in public transport. And this means like more or less 500 hours a, a year. So it is like a lot, a lot of time. And the main problem in which I focus is that there is no open data. So if you want to go to a certain place, you have to ask to other users or to the bus drivers without knowing if they are giving you like exact information. So this makes it like a little bit complex for citizens to use it. Like only if you are a, a user that regularly uses a route, you know how to move from certain place to another, but if not, like it is a complete um, challenge to move in public transport. And other, like other part of the problem that it is related, it's the shadiness in the subject. So this happens because there is a lot of conflict of interest between the stakeholders that I will explain to you later which, which they are. But like they have they have made like this information secret and only a few people can access to it, but without without knowing if it's like the exact information of the routes. And the, another problem is that the city center that you can see in the map here concentrates 70% of the total of the metropolitan routes. So we imagine like there is a part of the city center where more than a hundred routes superimpose like in the same street. So it is like a complete mess, public transport. So like after doing the research and understanding like who are suffering the problem and why this is happening, why is this happening? Um, I found three main topics why does why this needs to be solved. The first problem is like that we have an equal service. So as I told you before, there are areas of the city with saturation of routes, and there are some other areas that have no coverage of public transport. Then we have that there is a lack of transit oriented development because these routes were established more than 50 years ago. So they haven't been like actualized to the citizens needs that, that are currently happening you know and more with the pandemics like the citizens behavior has changed a lot and the routes are still the same that were established like many years ago and the third point is a sustainable development because well not having efficient uh, public transport systems affects the economy the social well-being and the environment so there are three main stakeholders involved they are the users that are like the ones that use the service, the bus agencies or bus enterprises and the government. Just like to give you a, a quick summary of how this works. The government gives the permission to the enterprises to operate, but like they aren't, they are private agencies, but they rely in the government and they establish like where are the areas of the city where the bus route can be established. So one of the, of the main objectives or mottos that, that I have is that what can be measured can be improved. And so there I discovered the need of having actualized data of how the citizens move to develop a project that adequates to their needs. So the solution, is a startup that I'm the founder of. It's named Muevetex, and Muevetex aims to improve the experience in the journeys of public transport users through open data. And we facilitate the cooperation through a channel of communication among the stakeholders. As I told you before, the stakeholders are the users, the government, and the bus agencies. So we do it first, we involve citizens in the collaborative mapping. We believe that the only way to solve a problem is by involving everyone who suffers from it. Therefore, we obtain and process data from the experts of public transport that are the users. We launched a collaborative mapping and the users were able to, to um, do the route and send it to us so we can process it and have like the first map of public transport in, in the metropolitan area of Toluca. Then we process this information and we offer the routes information through a web app that we developed. 
So this was the first web app of public transport in this area. So it was like amazing because for the first time, the users can know which, which are the best routes to move from certain place to another. And then with the mobility that obtained from the patterns that they, that they use, we, we obtain this mobility data and the feedback from the users, process that information and offer it to the bus agencies and to the government so they can improve the service and the government can, can know what are the citizens need to implement public policies. So we started we, in June 2020 with the beginning of the collaborative mapping and on field work. We had 10 routes mapped. Then in November 2020, we launched a crowdfunding campaign where, where we obtained money to develop the first version of the web app. Then on February of 2021, I joined to the Local Pathways Fellowship that helped me a lot to establish the best methodology to follow and how to make an approach with the government and other stakeholders. And then with the, with the beginning of that knowledge, I'm at March of 2021, I signed an agreement of collaboration with the local government to restructuring the bus stops. At July, we launched the pilot of the web app and the next steps are the official launching of the web app. And we are in talks to sign an agreement of collaboration with the state government and the bus agencies. So this was really amazing because as I told you before, for the first time we had the metropolitan area routes mapped and we, had, we gathered a total of 95. 95% of the public transport routes, that they are 296 routes that correspond to 29 enterprises. And here is where you can see the, the web app that I developed. Um, you can, as a, as a user, you can establish where you are, where you want to go, and then the app will give you information of the different routes that are like 300 meters uh, near to you. And you can also see information of, of the most important places that the route goes by, the, the time that it, it takes um, to use that route. And also you can rate the service. And uh, also I implemented this, that is the real-time alarms because we aim to to build a community of people that, that are interested in improving public transport. So with this, the user is able to emit security alarms, traffic alarms, gender violence alarms, and give feedback of the driver and bus conditions. And as I told you before, all this information, we process it. So we know which is the, the rate that each, each user is giving to every route of every bus agency and we obtain this data and process it. So this is a little bit of the impact of the solution. Um, and at the, at the, in this picture, you can see um, how do the, do the users move through the, through the city using the app. We can see the mobility patterns obtained. And then we can compare like if the service actually gives service to the citizens needs and then we can also see like if where are the concentrations of the users and know which is the quality of the service that they are obtaining so we can identify which are the principal areas where users need the service and then give this information to the government so they can see which are the the points where where the service is required and where they aren't like bus routes to give service to these users. And well, through all this time and, and in the fellowship and like in the road as an entrepreneur, I have found like a lot of things that I want to share with you. First is that, well, this chart is like how I thought it would be. And I thought that it would be like super easy that only you, you have like to pick a problem and decide to choose to solve it. And it would like eventually everything will take place. But the truth is that it has been like a roller coaster of, of emotion and of experiences. But like I intend 
to share with you that it has been like amazing this this journey and i know that it is only the beginning so so at the end it is all worth it no like to see that you can have a real impact in your community and that you can build also a community of of people that that don't not only complain about a problem but that have like this this um, emotion or this passion for solving a, a problem so i invite you like if you have a, a urban problem in your context like to see the way that you can also do something to solve it and and start like today and just like to end this is one of my favorite quotes and i maybe you you have heard it but it says, and it is of Steve Jobs, that the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who do. So I invite you like to be crazy enough and think of a problem that your cities are facing and develop a solution that can help not only in your local context, but you can like expand it to every other city of the world that has the same issues. And I invite you to follow us on social media and be part of the transformation of public transport. Thank you so much. And thank you very much, uh, Regina, for sharing your uh, project with us today. Uh, this is certainly very impressive and it showcases how the use of data can um, improve uh, the quality of life in cities and how we can use it to our advantage. Um, I apologize at the beginning, I uh, didn't uh, introduce you properly. Uh, just so you know, uh, Regina is a passionate social entrepreneur. Uh, she graduated from urban planning, and as you can see, she's transforming urban mobility. Um, and um, well, now we are gonna move on to our next uh, speaker. Uh, his name is uh, Boniface Abudo. Uh, he is the lead urban planning planner and GIS analyst at EcoBuild Africa. This is an environmental, architectural, and sustainable urban development firm based in Nairobi, Kenya. And since 2016, he has a, used his expertise in various urban development projects, including leading uh, the team that developed the integrated urban development plans for Chevunio and Chebote, Chebole towns. Uh, he holds a bachelor in urban and regional planning from Mancino University. And without uh, further ado, I uh, pass on the word to you. Thank you so much. I trust you can hear me. Um, let me just share the, my screen so at least you can follow up. Yeah, so um, it's loading. my project is uh, about sanitation. It is about improving uh, slum sanitation through stakeholders engagement, a case study of Kibra slum in Nairobi, Kenya. Yeah, so that you may know, Kibra is one of the biggest slums, not just in Kenya, but also in Africa. That is where I grew up in. And, uh, as, as I was growing up as a young boy in Kibra, I made a promise to myself that when I get into a position where can I help, this, this will be my very first priority. There is a phenomenon happening in Kibra that is uh, not very uh, friendly. People do not have access to proper toilet, so they tend to relieve themselves in uh, containers, some use plastic bags, then they throw them pro uh, probably on a drainages, on pathways and so on and so forth. I went through this as a young boy. And therefore, when I got the chance to uh, make uh, uh, to work on a project, I couldn't think of anything else but this one. I want to eliminate this one completely so we can have a cleaner, uh, uh, a, a cleaner, cleaner Kibra courtesy of, of, of me. So, um, this phenomenon, we call it flying toilets because people tend to throw these things uh, as, as far as 
as far as they can. They say out, out of sight, out of mind. Once you relieve leave yourself, you throw them as, as a waste. You can mostly in drainages. As you can see, that fiction was screamed. That is part of Hebra, actually. And that's, those, those are some of the places where they throw these, uh, these, these fecal waste. The reason why I thought this should be solved, apart from just losing the dignity, you can just imagine you are pressed and you need to relieve yourself, but you can't assess a proper trail existence. This has also contributed a lot of waterborne diseases, including cholera, dysentery, diarrhea, and typhoid, which in most cases are fatal, especially to the young children and the special mothers. So I thought if at least we could solve this one, then we can save a lot of lives. This problem has even caught the attention of international media. As you can see, uh, an extract from uh, an article wrote, uh, uh, written by Mel Guardian says that where there are no latrines, girls and women have to wait until it is dark to look for uh, a place to relieve themselves. Inside his compact but neatly and tidy home, having two children play video games. He says it's hard to take them to the doctor on more than one occasion to treat diseases they picked up after playing the street. This is truly a crisis. Then the lastly, another part of the article from Al Jazeera as well says that uh, flying toilets are a symptom of Hebra's lack of proper sewerage system. Hardly any in this impoverished corner of Nairobi has the luxury of a toilet system there in the, in their, inside their home. Some have an outdoor toilet shell between multiple dwellings, but these are simply pillars like things that need to be emptied every now and again. So let's look at the situation in, the, in, 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 in Kenya, what, what it feels like. So ideally, uh, almost 50% of all the urban residents uh, uh, staying in, uh, in, in Kenya live in slums. Kenya has so many slums. Kibra is just one of them. You have Korogosho slum, you have Malari slum, and so on and so forth. So the whole idea really is to ensure that once this is implemented in Kibra, then we can implement it to other parts of the, other parts of the, of, of the country, in other slums as well, because it is not only happening in Kibra, although Kibra is adversely affected, that's why it took as my case study. But the whole idea is to start in Kibra, then spread it out to other parts of the slum. So suggested solution, my solution is threefold and it's quite simple really. Uh, I realized that the, the first government efforts in, in, in eliminating this, uh, this practice in Kibra failed majorly because the stakeholders, the, the, local, the local people were not engaged in the process. People sat in the offices in Nairobi, came up with the plans, then came to impose them on the people. So my approach is different. I want to involve the people from the beginning. I want to ask, I want to create awareness to them, teach them the importance of having proper toilet system and the dangers of using the, uh, the, the, the flying toilets. So that's what I'm saying that it's threefold. It, it is, uh, the first part is the cold engagement or creating public awareness. Then this initiative, I, I baptize it as adopt a toilet initiative where I will ensure every household in Kibra has an access to a proper functioning toilet. And I will do this through dig dig digging more pits like trains because the ones are, the years are few and encouraging communal use rather than individual use. The whole goal really here is to promote public participation. It may look simple, but uh, I could have done other more complicated projects. But to me, this was this is the thing is because my family grew up here and I know what it feels like to be in this kind of a condition. So we, I, I'm, I'm thinking that if we import public participation from the beginning, at least this, we may have a change because these people will feel they own this project. And by doing this uh, slowly by slowly, probably by, by the next probably five years or even a decade, this is the thing of the past. So my approach is to work this out differently through uh, an approach I call bottom up approach where decisions should be made from the gas levels. The impacts, once I manage to implement this project, I will tend to have a cleaner community, a cleaner Kibra, where everyone staying in Kibra will have an access to a proper functioning storage facility, 
and the complete elimination of the persistent plain toilet menace in Kibra. And of course, I intend to face some challenges while in doing this. One, one of the major challenges that I tend to face is insufficient funding because we need money to dig this pit like trains. We need money to uh, hire skilled labor. And then we don't have existing data. For example, we, don't, we are not aware of how many toilets exactly exist in Kibra. If we knew this, then we can table it against the number of people and know how many we need to, uh, to construct. Then we have bureaucracy. There are so many protocols to be followed. For example, when seeking building permits, you need to go to a city planner, you have to introduce yourself, you have, and so many other offices. Then, of course, we have insufficient support from stakeholders, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, most so the political leadership. But uh, these are some challenges that I may, I may face when implementing this project. But nonetheless, nothing comes easy. I'm prepared to face them as I implement the project because it must work. So in a nutshell, really, uh, as I indicated earlier on, the government's efforts have been, uh, uh, in, in carving out these challenges have been failing majorly because the people are not involved from the onset. My approach is different. Kibra is my home, it was my home and it's still my home. I want to involve people from the onset and ensure that at least by the end of it all, this project is eliminated. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, your presentation. Uh, as one of us mentions, uh, this is a big uh, challenge, uh, not only in this region of the world, but also in regions such as Asia and India. Uh, and uh, having the proper infrastructure cities need will ultimately dictate uh, the, the emissions the city produces. Uh, so, uh, having the community involved in the decision making and in the solution design is definitely a, should be at, top of, at the top of every uh, local uh, agenda. And now we're going to go, go uh, Boniface, if you could stop sharing your screen. Uh, we're going to go now uh, with uh, Fatima. Um, Fatima, uh, Mahmoud is an environmental specialist from Islamabad, Pakistan. Uh, she's currently the, pro the program manager at the Green Box, uh, working on themes of climate change, sustainable development, and the environment. Uh, besides this, as a local Pathways 2021 fellow, she uh, is amidst the development of a project addressing uh, SDG 11.6 in her city uh, through the creation of a targeted education and training program called a Breathe Islamabad, which she will be uh, talking to us about right now. Thank you so much, Anna. Let me just share, share my screen. Right, I hope everyone can hear me and see my screen as well. So hello everyone, I am so grateful to be here to talk about my fellowship project, which definitely is still in the design phase, uh, but I'm thrilled to share my vision about Breathe Islamabad. So I will begin uh, with the issue overview. My project is targeting SDG 11.6, which states that by 2030, cities are to reduce their adverse per capita environmental impact. And the project will be focusing on um, air quality, which aligns with the relevant indicator 6.2. Now, it's no secret that air pollution is one of the biggest challenges that the world faces currently, and there are a number of reasons to it. Foremost are definitely the health costs. So particulate matter is a criteria pollutant which can constitute a very high risk for health, majorly as it increases the mortality rate from respiratory and cardiovascular diseases. And there is mounting evidence in studies that it is linked with mental health problems as well. The WHO states that not out of 10 people, nine, in the nine out of 10 people in the world breathe highly polluted air, which, is, which leads to approximately 7 million premature deaths each year. And 600,000 of these are children. Now, apart from the devastating and alarming health implications, the estimated cost to the global economy by air pollution accumulates to about 3.3% of the global GDP. 
And this is further mounted by the range of environmental problems it also gives rise to. If I then shift my focus to my city, Islamabad, it is ranked the 10th most polluted city in the country. And in global rankings, it's the 11th most polluted world capital. The city's data records reveal that the annual average of the PM 2.5 levels exceed both the National Environmental Quality Standards and the WHO guidelines. Now, the photographs that you see on your screens have been taken by me last year. And the first two indicate good air quality and were taken during the peak of the pandemic lockdowns when much like the rest of the world, Islamabad too was experiencing clear blue skies. And the last one is taken from a day with unhealthy air quality and was taken later in the year. So you can just see the clear contrast between them. Now in the following graph, I've collated the air quality indices for the months of February and March, and it reiterates the fact that apart from the two day post rain, which washes away the pollutants, the air quality remains moderate to unhealthy. This trend is also verified by the IQA report, which suggests that 71% of the days in Islamabad, the air quality is in exceedance for the WHO safety target. In terms of sources, there are a plethora of point and non-point sources, ranging from open garbage burning, firewood for cooking in the slums or informal settlements, industrial units, mining, and vehicular emissions. Now, it's safe to say that at this point of my research, I was definitely very overwhelmed because of um, you know, how very complex the problem was. So post discussions with my mentor, I decided to tackle only one of these sources to begin with so I can create a really realistic solution. And so I redirected my study to focus on vehicular emissions, mostly because of the repetitive emphasis on it in literature and also its share in the problem. Now, again, I feel like these pictures show the stark change from the 90s Islamabad and to that that is now matched um, with statistics, which report that there's an addition of around 200 to 230 vehicles per day and the same or probably more for motorbikes. So having critically reviewed this data and living through the reality of lockdown clean air, it felt natural to believe that addressing this will reduce emissions immensely in the city. Now delving into how the problem is being addressed currently in terms of policies and laws, there are some city specific and then national standards that exist that, have, uh, that I have analyzed. So starting off with the original master plan of Islamabad, which was designed in 1960, and this had the philosophy of incorporating green spaces or buffer zones to counter air pollution in the city and reduce mobility by providing access to basic services within each sector that was planned out. However, with the expansion of the city from a quaint administrative unit to a buzzing metropolis and the territorial expanse, the population growth and easy acquisition of vehicles led to a very negative tipping point of pollution levels. And today the plan failed to sustain. Similarly, we have uh, the Capital Development Authority's regulation, um, which prohibits emission of air pollutants above certain permissible limits. Now, although there are no city-specific standards that have been explicitly described even in the regulation, the Environmental Protection Agency in the city is responsible for monitoring and reporting of pollutant levels. Now, in terms of the NEQs, the standards have become more stringent over the years. However, by large, Islamabad has failed to comply, as we've seen in the introductory slides. There are also motor vehicle specific national standards, but that which have become outdated and really need strict upgradation. And finally, we have the Pakistan Clean Air Program. Um, this by far is a very welcome step in identification of the gaps that exist and the need for capacity building and monitoring something which definitely aligns to the city's uh, specific action plan that I'm working on as well. But overall, regardless of the laws and policies and paper, the implementation of environmental quality standards is pretty much non-existent and not stringent enough due to the lack of compliance and monitoring. So whenever solution ideation begins, the first step is definitely to know your stakeholders. And since air pollution is such an expansive issue that it impacts literally everyone, um, and it to a lot of extent is driven by the behaviors of the community, 
which is why for me, this could only be resolved by including everyone in it, although at different stages and through different modes. So major stakeholders in my city would include the public, um, that includes the users and non-users of vehicles, organizations with vehicular fleets, such as schools and offices, the local administration, which works on implementation, and then NGOs, INGOs, or like-minded organizations, which can be collaborated with to network, outreach, or fundraise. Now, moving on to the solution design then, my solution will be realized through a multi-dimensional and stepwise approach, preparing the groundwork before introducing measures to ensure that there is acceptability and therefore sustainability of the solution, instead of you know, just enforcing the ideas and mechanisms. So in the first phase, I will be developing an effective communication and knowledge dissemination plan for raising awareness amongst the targeted stakeholders. This will include both educational material in English and the local language, which is Urdu. And um, this can be designed as a self-paced virtual or in-person course according to the needs and literacy level of our target, targeted stakeholders. And this will be supported by social media campaigning to reinforce the message and ensure public outreach and holding webinars or workshops to involve the local schools, universities, organizations, and public offices in a citywide clean air dialogue. And once the baseline is formed in the phase one, an informed city can hopefully welcome more strategic plans. We can then move towards formulation of a working group panel of experts that continues to engage with stakeholders in the administration and in the public regarding an inclusive and effective vehicular testing or emission reduction plan, which is uh, in line with global best practices. Now, um, an additional thing that I really want to in incorporate here is to engage young students and early career professionals who can provide the energy and resources on ground and advance this as an intergenerational ownership of the cause. In terms of the impact through this project, I hope to mainstream the idea and awareness with regards to vehicular emissions in the community by increasing public access to information and data in a very simple and comprehensible manner. Secondly, I, I hope to pave the way for an on-ground effective effort for vehicular testing and emission control through technical capacity building of the administration. Lastly, I can hope that this will create a dedicated and well-resourced program, which can be expanded within the city and beyond. The success of the program very much depends on the intent and willingness of the stakeholders to receive and then work upon the strategies. Behavioral changes and acceptability definitely takes time. And so this will require some persistent efforts continuously and not as a one-time event only. And to carry out effectively, especially in terms of the quality and outreach, the engagement, all of this requires resources, whether it's financial, human, or technical. And so this can definitely be a restricting factor. Now, just before I end this, a last few words to sum it up. Challenges exist everywhere, but what is important is to know that you have to start somewhere. To me, my vision for my city is boundless, and I really believe that consistent efforts in educating and creating acceptability prior to regulation will definitely set the ball rolling for achieving SDG 11 for my city. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Fatima, for uh, your presentation. I think this outlines perfectly how overwhelmed we can feel by these uh, big challenges. And when you hear sometimes uh, create a sustainable city and you, you have it in front of you, you can feel it's impossible. Uh, but you have taught us how if you dissect the issue and are able to focus your efforts, we can definitely make progress for making this a reality. Uh, so uh, this is definitely the way to go. And uh, this was our last presentation. This is just a sample of uh, the potential uh, incorporating youth that the decision-making table has. Uh, this is the type of ideas that we can bring uh, to, to solve a, 
uh, emissions and uh, ultimately city solutions. And uh, now I would like to invite all the speakers to turn on their cameras for uh, the Q&A portion. And um, as a questions come in through the Q&A box, maybe I would like to start uh, asking all of you if you could share what the challenges were for you, what the biggest challenges were for you in localizing SDG 11 in your city. Like when you're developing a, a project that addresses sustainability in your city, what was the main uh, challenge for each one of you? Um, I don't know if you'd like to start in the order that we have the presentations. Uh, so maybe Regina. Yes, thank you, Anna. I think that the main that the main challenge, and it is like similar to what Fatima just told us, is like identifying like where are you going to like the problem is a huge problem, you know. Like for example, public transport, uh, like it has like a lot a lot of challenges, but. Uh, like I couldn't define at the beginning, like in what part was in the one that I was going to focus, you know, like the environmental impact or like the, the quality of the buses. So like identifying in which part you can develop a solution and the impact that it will, it will have. You know, like for me, it was like defining how with my, with my project, I could help to, like to reach the goal of of 11 of SDG 11.2 so then I knew like it was like developing a solution that helped to actualize the percentage of the population that has access to public transport through the development of a tool but I think that that was like the main challenge and then like the stakeholder involvement because like it has been an issue for many years that many people has tried to solve but like when they discovered that it's like a lot of conflict of interest they they call this industry like a mafia i don't know how to say it in english but like involving with with these people and like teaching them or sharing with them that this will like help them to have a better city and a better context i think that it they those are the main challenges uh, yeah, I definitely uh, feel you and that's why I feel the sustainable development goals are a very good way of uh, splitting the challenges we are facing today and gives us a guiding frame for how to tackle this. Um, and if we each focus our expertise on where uh, we can or where we can uh, that's how we will uh, keep moving forward uh, Boniface for you which one was the biggest challenge when you were developing your project thank you Anna uh, my biggest challenge was uh, <clears throat> what well, there were two actually one was lack of data then two was uh, financing financial constraints as I told you earlier on my project uh, it looks simple, but needs financial uh, financial muscle for you to just uh, you know engage with these people. Some some do ask you, what are we going to gain in the long run? We've been staying this way for years and years. If you don't buy us lunch, you don't want to come for your meeting. So yes, financial uh, constant was a major problem when I was I was going around the stakeholders, sharing my idea with the local people in Kibra. The lack of data. As I said earlier on, I was presenting, I don't exactly know how many toilets we have in Kibra that are existing. So I can't exactly know how many we name uh, so, so that at least we can at least have some uh, good number that each household in Kibra will be, be able to access uh, the, the, the toilet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, lack of data is something that in many of the Global South cities uh, experience uh, as uh, Regina and I can speak for, for Mexico many times, the data is either not non-existent uh, and therefore Regina is creating a system to capture it or uh, it's very poorly organized. Uh, so uh, yeah, this you're not alone on this uh, challenge for sure. Maybe on that thought, I would like to follow up with a question that we received 
through the Q&A, and this is uh, from Carol Bottle. Um, he's asking uh, if you've heard about an initiative called Adopt a Light that was um, unsuccessful due to some vandalism. If you have given any thoughts on how this could affect your Adopt a Toilet um, proposal. Uh, and yeah, he also speaks about the um, as you mentioned, lack of financial support and lack of belief from the government for these type of solutions. Uh, so uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I believe Boniface got disconnected for a second. Um, so hopefully he'll join back on and we can circle back on this question. Uh, for you, Fatima, which one was the biggest challenge when uh, localizing SDG 11? Well, I mean, like everyone just said here, um, for me, it was also lack of data, especially in the development part of my project. I, I felt like at times it was either non-existent or existent or it was outdated. And then sometimes we had different sources of data and there was a lot of discrepancy between them. So I felt like, you know, if you can't, have like they you can't make data driven solutions if it doesn't exist or it's outdated so i felt like lack of data was definitely something that was limiting for me as well and secondly i'd also like to add that um you know although i'm not at the implementation phase just yet i've already experienced that a lot of stakeholders show reluctancy when speaking to youth or especially indivi as individuals, you know, there's a lot of reluctancy to engage with youth. So I felt like those things are, um, those both of those points were definitely limiting in developing my project till now. Uh, yeah, so um, from, from what we've heard from all of the fellows that have gone through our program, uh, these are definitely some of the main challenges, the lack of data, uh, the lack of uh, funding to actually roll out the projects, uh, but also the lack of a, a pathways or access to local government. Many times, as you have showed, the ideas are there. There are a lot of people that have a, the ability to design the solutions to the challenges our cities present, but sometimes the youth who are the most creative ones do not have their voices heard at the at the municipality and um, so something we've heard from former fellows is that uh, being part of the fellowship gives them a uh, credibility and some like pre-validation to go and introduce themselves to the local government um, fellows that have said that in the past maybe they tried to get an appointment with the with the local uh, government and they just like either didn't receive an answer or the answer was no but when they came back and introduced themselves as i'm a local public fellow this is a program from uh, the sustainable development solutions network uh, youth uh, we are a group of 100 people that were selected because of our expertise skill set and so on and i'm working on this project that is part of this organization it opens up so many do doors for them so um we always push uh, the fellows to make uh, the most uh, out of this uh, and to leverage their role as a fellow as much uh, as possible. And now uh, for uh, another question, which kind of I opened up the floor for would be, did you find any challenges uh, related to your, your age uh, when implementing this project? In the same order that we answered? Yes. Okay. Yes, I think that just as you said, like maybe I think that they relate that we are young and we don't like they think that because we are young, we don't know what we are doing or what, what we're talking about. So for me, it was like a double challenge because first, like being young and the other, it's like it is a, a male industry and they are only like male leaders. So like, I remember the first time I went with all the leaders from the bus agencies, they were like 30 uh, men sitting and they, they told me like, why, why was I the, 
like the young girl that wanted to change public transport, you know, but not like recog in recognition. It was like, oh, she's crazy and she wants to change public transport. So I, I think that like they see us like young and like they, they have been there for many years. So they think that they are the ones that have the expertise to solve a certain problem. But like we have seen that that they aren't experts enough because the problems are still there, you know? So like, I think that that was with a sector, but then with the government, they see it like, okay, maybe they are young and they have like fresh ideas and you, you know, like uh, they know like new ways to solve it. So let's give them a, an opportunity. So I think that it could be like use it, like used for, for obtaining like a recognition or or maybe they can see you as, as if you don't know, no? But there is like our opportunity to show them that being young isn't an, a disadvantage. Like we have all the power and the creativity and this optimis, optimism of thinking, thinking that we can change the world. I think that it's like what give us like a leverage from the other people. I don't know, Fatima and Boniface. Yeah, I think Regina just like spoke my mind. Like I, I feel the same way. Um, in my experience, I felt like um, the NGOs or the social enterprises were more um, open to talk to me when I was uh, engaging with them, uh, but not so much the local government. Um, but definitely maybe in the future, they will cooperate. Um, and like Rahina said, there are people who still have conventional thinking who think that, you know, youth uh, are, we shouldn't take youth very seriously. So uh, yeah, I felt like that was a huge challenge as well. Like they see like more roadblocks and they don't want to like, you know, take it on, take the projects on that youth have to, um, you know, basically, if youth bring up any transformative or innovative ideas. Um, but I'll, I'd also like to share like my experience through the uh, local pathway fellowship that a couple of months ago, I got to um, uh, basically pitch my idea to one of the key stakeholders in the city and having that backing from LPF, they really gave me a very positive response. So, you know, having that network with you is very important. Maybe sometimes people won't take you very seriously as an individual, but when you have a backing of something like LPF, you know, it really puts confidence into that engagement. So, yes. Yeah, well, that's uh, good to hear. Uh, it, that's what keeps us uh, working so hard at night. Um, Boniface, do you have any comments on this? The question was, if you found any challenges because of your age on developing your project? Yes, I did. I, I found uh, a number of challenges <laughs> uh, because I am young um, and a number of people really doubted if I was genuine, if I wanted to help them for free. Actually, some thought I was doing this for political mileage because my people are used to being helped than getting something else in return. So when I, I walked around Kibra and shared my idea with them and told them what I wanted to do, they asked me, a young man, what position are you vying for? Are you vying for an MCA? Do you want to be an MP? Why are you doing this? So I, I, that is also a major challenge that I faced because they felt I'm not genuine. Why, why Kibra? Why am I helping the people of Kibra? I'm just a, a, a nobody, son of a nobody. Why would I want to go to them, to them to try to help them and getting nothing in return? But at, at the same time, there were also some advantages that I got by being young. The fact that I grew up in Kibra, I knew every corner of Kibra. Uh, the challenges these people went through, I went through them, me uh, as a person, I understand them very, very well. I know the people staying in Kibra, the local leadership, I understand them. So when I went to them and told them whatever I had, I also got some support from them. So there were those who doubted my uh, what, what, what I was doing. There were also those who believed in me. They were twofold. Uh, yeah, well, I think the message is uh, kind of unified. Uh, we've all experienced this. However, at SDS News, we believe 
that a talent is talent and it doesn't matter your age like we very much respect experience uh, but as uh, we've seen uh, some of the some some of people's greatest work is developed in their early careers uh, like one example can be Albert Einstein wrote the theory of relativity uh, early in his uh, 20s uh, so the talent is there and it should be tapped into um, so now I, I want to take a break from the questions. Uh, we have an attendee, Jane. Uh, you have your hand up. Uh, wondering if you want to make a question. Okay, she put her hand up. So, um, and um, well, maybe uh, Boniface, while you've got this connected, uh, we got a question from the audience asking, if you've heard about a project called Adopt a Light that also uh, experienced a lack of uh, financing, government support, and experience some vandalism, if you've, uh, well, it's suggesting you to take this into consideration and if you've given a thought to this and how this could be addressed. Yes, I can respond to that, Anna. The reason why adopt a light uh, a light fail in Kibra is because of what I'm doing right now. The community was not involved, Anna. The, the, as I said, the set in the in Nairobi came up with this and took it to the uh, Kibra res res residents. Those who are hungry people, they have not been explained the importance of having these floodlights. So when they saw the opportunity of, 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 of vandalizing these and selling them to get money in return, to put food on the table. That's what they did. So my approach is different in that I want to involve these people in whatever I am doing. I am going to explain to them, hey, you guys, we're doing this, we're doing one, two, three, we're doing it because of ABC. So when they own the project from the onset, I feel that they won't, they, they, there won't be less resistance, there will be less opposition because already they know whatever they are doing and what they will gain from that. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's definitely the way to go if you want uh, the community to accept a new uh, proposal, you need to make them part uh, of it in order to, uh, for them to understand the benefits that they get, but also to take care of it and to take ownership uh, of it. Uh, well, I don't see any more uh, questions coming uh, through, so maybe I would just like to uh, wrap up the session with um, a final thought that you want to share um, what are a uh, good strategies or advice you want to give the youth out there uh, when when they're trying to improve their city yes thanks anna well i think that that the first one would be like look for this kind of support like, like as fatima said i think that having a a backup such as sdsn and the lpf it is like a, a support that you will need like to have this kind of pre-validation of a renowned organization. So if you have like this idea or interest in SDG 11, apply to the, to the program. It will give you like a huge network and a lot of tools that you will need like to develop your project. And my other advice would be like start today with, with whatever you have like sometimes we think that we need like the super project super developed and a lot of financing and a lot of things to start and well that is true but like you can start now and give like little steps and then you will achieve like a long time impact and also like look for people that support you and create this awareness in your community because if you don't create this awareness like people won't own the project and it won't succeed and the last one is like believe that you can you know like i always say that i think that we can really change the world with the right team so like be crazy enough and think that you can change the world and you will be like halfway there that's it thank you Regina. fatima i'll just go ahead right so um, my message would be that I think that everyone should educate themselves and, um, you know, acquire the skills so you know that you're coming from a place of knowledge when you are addressing issues, right? 
And secondly, I'll also say that sometimes um, we are so living in such a bubble that we forget that there are people who are very much different from us. And some issues which might seem small to us may mean a lot to others. So we should always be empathetic of others. And yeah, like Rahina said, I think you should start today, start now, start small, and we will get somewhere. So yeah, I'm best of luck to everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bonifaz. Thank you. My advice uh, to the young person watching me right now is to believe in themselves. It is, they, they always tell us that uh, the youth are the leaders of tomorrow, but I believe that the youth are the leaders of today. Believe in yourself. If they, you feel there's something that you can do to change the, your community, go for it, go forth. Then two, avail uh, this kind of programs that like the LPF that you avail uh, for, 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 uh, for us. So because these are like uh, the place where you get the knowledge and the expertise and the skills that we need, to uh, take this project moving forward. I also want to encourage the youth to have a positive attitude uh, to, uh, generally towards, towards uh, making a change in their community because it's only through this that CRT will remember you with one day. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, this is the perfect uh, statement to, to close with. Uh, so uh, for all our attendees, um, here today, if you are part of an organization that does not have a, a young person in your team, we highly encourage you to uh, bring them on board. They come in with very different ideas. If you're a young person out there uh, making your uh, starting of your career, uh, as Regina said, uh, start today, um, and then you're one day ahead. Uh, as Fabino said, uh, let's try to uh, be empathic and in try to inform ourselves on uh, the issues that we're trying to make uh, an impact or inform ourselves before uh, we, we make any statements or we try to speak about other uh, situations. And um, as Bonifaz says, uh, we are the present, uh, not, not the future. And so thank you very much everyone for uh, being here with us today. Um, and that would be from our side. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye.